to start with, hopefully you all had a chance to download the data that I shared with you. What I'm gonna do is just share my screen. So, so the idea for this workshop is really just to take you through um, you know, some of the basic features and, and you know, really make you feel comfortable using Fiji for a lot of the data that we're working with at, at the Institute and outside in Colombia. Um, you know, I think a lot of times people like go straight to Imaris or some more advanced tools because they're not really aware of what's available in open source tools. And sometimes that can actually slow them down or, or you know, make the project more difficult. So I'm just going to take you through like some basic things and then towards some more advanced uses of, of Fiji. And then if you join next week, we'll actually use some of what we learned today, along with a whole lot of other new things to automate this analysis using uh, ImageJ and use some of the more advanced uh, tools. Uh, I'll just share the screen. Okay, so maybe many of you have actually already used ImageJ or Fiji in the past. And I think one of the you know, main things is you sort of see this sort of gray rectangle and it can be a little bit underwhelming and maybe a little bit unsophisticated, but there's a lot of capability that's, that's tucked away in, in ImageJ and a lot of tools for automating and, and doing many of the things that we actually wanna do in biomedical imaging analysis. And uh, you know, just to get started, what I shared with you is some example data sets. One of these is an ND2 file, this image number one here. And this is a good example just to get started with. You know, I think sometimes people are tempted to just save their data as TIFF files at the microscope, but it's a really good idea just to keep them in the proprietary format. And, and we use many Nikon and Zeiss systems here. So the ND2 or CZI format is best and you'll be able to open them up. Um, you know, this bioformats importer will allow you to open many of these images up straight away. And we can just click okay here, but I'll, we'll come back to this actually uh, shortly to look at some of the ways you can save time here. So these ND2 files can take a little bit of time to open, but there's actually some ways to look at them even faster using Fiji. Uh, just to like get your bearings, you know, a lot of these tools here, like these are just for selecting and counting in the images. And what some people don't realize is you can actually change a lot of features in here. So, you know, just to get started, you know, you can, you know, use like these tools to draw regions on the image. But you can also double click on them to get extra features. And, and there's actually some really useful ones in here. I mean, especially if you're just doing manual counts, like maybe you're trying to validate some sort of automatic counting that you're doing. You know, in here, you can turn this to a multi-point tool versus a single point tool. You can use, if you double click, you've got all these features in here for changing the shape and color. So you can look at different populations. Um, and actually we'll come back to like, you know, how you can use the wand and, and some of the quick selection tools later on. And then up in the menu, there's a whole lot of things. Um, we'll, we'll be going through a bunch of these today, but useful things in here is if you're trying to sort of troubleshoot something, ImageJ actually has a whole lot of example data. So oftentimes if you're just trying to understand how something works, a useful one is just to open up this blobs image. It's a small image that you can sort of test, like, you know, how to, how to do object detection and how filtering works and things like that. So these are like, or if you're just trying to get a script to work and you're not sure where the problem is, then these little sample images are quite useful. Um, and then we have a lot of like adjustments where we can adjust, you know, things in the image, a um, whole lot of stuff to do with stacks, which we'll take you through. A whole lot in here that you, it's actually sometimes very slow to doing things like Imaris, these um, analysis tools and processing tools. Um, and then a huge selection of, you know, this is sort of like, Fiji comes with a lot of plugins included already, and these are sort of the most useful ones for a lot of biomedical imaging, but there's a huge community working on tools for ImageJ. And next week we'll go into some of these sort of more advanced tools. And it's very easy to add these tools in and combine them together with existing tools to get a really nice uh, pipeline for image analysis. And so the first thing, you know, with this image, Whenever you're working with images in ImageJ, it's really important to check the image properties. If, if you're going to do anything that's quantitative, come into properties and just check straight away if you're getting something sensible in pixel width, height, and depth. And there's, I can't count how many times I've worked with on projects with people where this has been a, a cause of a problem because the data didn't export with the dimensions or the dimensions got lost somewhere along the way. And then if you're making measurements with area and volume, then what you're reporting is completely inaccurate if these aren't correct. Um, so, you know, it's always good, you know, even if you're working with the data for a while, just make sure this is still working the way you think it is. And the other thing is you can just press I and this will show you the image information. Sometimes some companies don't put the 
scaling information in a way that it goes into properties like we were looking at, but it will be in this information here. And so all, all this stuff in here is like, you know, how the image was acquired, like exposure times, laser powers, all that sort of stuff, depending on the company, you'll get all that information in here. And so this is really useful if like three years later, you're looking for, you know, for what happened with the experiment, there might be something useful in here. At the very least, like all the properties of like the dimensions will be in here. This is especially the case for the light sheet, which is a bit difficult to get the image dimensions from, but they're actually in here for the light sheet data. If you've just installed Fiji, there's some things you need to take care of in terms of options. Underneath more options here, if you're working with really big data, there's memory management in here. Make sure that you actually have like the main, like the amount of memory that your computer has so that you can actually work with really large files. Sometimes this defaults to a very small amount of memory and then you get stuck very quickly when you're working with big stacks or, or um, you know, slide scanner data. Okay. Yeah, so the other thing I wanted to show you actually with, with these ND2 files, uh, which you might not be aware of is you can, so, uh, so with all this sort of data, especially if it's a TIFF stack or if it's a um, proprietary format, you can use a virtual stack here to import the data very quickly. And this will open, you can see how much faster this was than when we were working before with that, just opening it completely. It's a little bit slower to interact with, but if this was say like a 20 gigabyte file, I could still open it up just as fast as I, I did now and then explore it. So, you know, if, if you're working with data from like some of the high-end instruments that can be very large files, this is a really nice way of just exploring the data on your laptop or showing someone in a lab meeting without having to wait 15 minutes or 10 minutes for this thing to, to load into memory. So this is actually a pretty common view. If you're working, especially, I know a lot of you work on like the, slide, the spinning disk where you're not always getting an image that's using up the full range of the camera. So you'll have images that look like they're black, but there's really a lot of information in there. The first thing that you'll wanna do is adjust the brightness and contrast. And on a PC, this is control shift C on Mac, it's command shift C. This will bring up the display adjustment or this brightness and contrast. And you know, in here, this is a histogram showing you what, what's happening with the intensity information. So this big peak here, this will be kind of all the background pixels. Usually this will just be the tissue or the, the, um, the background of the slide. Sometimes people are attempted to adjust like the brightness and contrast here. The best way to really think about this is just to use the, the min and max. So minimum will bring up the sort of the black level or sort of basically turn everything to black below this number. So if I go all the way up here to you know 1000, now the image looks completely black. Vice versa, this is the this maximum is the, the white level or the, the maximum intensity. If I bring this to the left, then everything above this number becomes white or the maximum intensity. And so that, that, that way you can get a really clear idea of what you're doing to the data. So if I go all the way to the left, then this image will just become completely red. So yeah, when you're sort of looking at these, you know, you can adjust these to get rid of the background, bring this down to get a little bit of contrast. We're not doing anything right now that's altering the data. We're just changing how it looks to us on the screen. And if you're not sure, what levels to adjust these to, just have a look in the image. So a really nice thing about Fiji is when you're hovering the cursor over the image, this up here in the status bar, it's gonna tell you what the intensity is. So you can get a very quick reading on like, okay, this cell is around 10,000, 12,000. Out here, this tissue is around 300. So you can very quickly get, get your bearings and figure out, okay, what, what, what should I adjust this to, to to get some sort of sensible image to look at. And the other thing that will catch people is like, you know, it, it can be a little bit frustrating. Like I've got a couple of channels here, but I can't look at them together at the same time. You can press like command shift C or, or, or control shift C if you're on a PC. Um, and this will bring up the channels tool. So these two are like ones you'll probably have open a lot if you're working um, in Fiji. And I, I can switch between the channels here, but probably more useful is to just use composite. And that way I can look at channels together. If, if I was looking at a four color channel uh, image, then I could check on any one of those channels to, to look at them together or you know, in, in part or completely together. And this way you can now like, you know, look at multicolor images you know, very easily, just like you would in like a more complicated uh, program. Yeah, there's actually like some other useful things in here. So set like may make you think that you're applying this thing or making a permanent change. But in fact, like if you click in here, 
but lets you be very specific about what sort of changes you're making. And so you can actually just say, look, I want 400 and I want this to be 5,000. And that way you're being very specific about what you're setting these levels to rather than trying to drag this to get that, that exact value. And you can also propagate these. So if you're working on like five different images, like from different experiments or different animals, and you just want to look at them all the same with these same levels, rather than like spending your time doing this for every image, you know, I can just like duplicate this. So I have two, you can propagate these to other images. So you can say, okay, look, I want this channel to be brighter. And I can propagate this to these other images. And that way I'm now looking at these images in the same way. So this is like a really useful thing if you've got lots of data and you're just trying to do everything consistently. You know, the other thing that I often do in, you know, this is kind of an easy image. Like it's very clear, like what's happening. There's like a couple of cells here and some of these cells are expressing another protein. But, you know, if, if it's a little bit ambiguous, like what's happening, a really useful thing to do is we can split these channels. And, you know, sometimes it can be a little bit hard. Like if I'm looking here, how do I know these, these spots here are actually inside this cell? So there's a really useful tool underneath Analyze, Tools, and Synchronize Windows. So this, we can synchronize like whichever images we have that we want to synchronize here. We just have two right now, so I'll select these two. And as soon as you're synchronizing these, now I can sort of say like, okay, is this green spot inside this red cell? Like I can actually look and see, okay, yeah, that, that, there it is. Like, so this is like a really nice way of exploring difficult data and, and being able to, you know, confirm visually what's happening. And the changes you make a lot of times if you're moving around. So I'm just pressing plus to, to move around. I think these, here's just going. Yeah, so now like now that I have that on, I can zoom in and out uh, and actually, you know, work with these images in the same way. I think I can even pan similarly. I'm just trying to go through things like just so you, you know, you just have these things in mind. So when you get to a project, you can think back and remember that this is available. And if you have any questions, like we can always uh, help, help you further. So I also wanted to show you how to deal with image sequences. So in the data that I shared with you, we have this Z stack data set. And this is just an image sequence of many TIFFs. You know, this could be very similar to data that you get from the light sheet, which can be very large, like 20 gigabytes. And it's very difficult to just load that into memory and start looking at it. But when you have a, a data set like this, the easiest thing to do is grab the folder and drag it onto VG. And you'll see something like this. We, are, we want to organize them numerically so that they open in order. And then we can also use virtual stack again. So if it's 20 gigabytes, I could turn this on and instantly start to explore this, this data set without having to worry about, you know, being on my laptop or something like that. Yeah, so, you know, this is a data set just of some neurons in tissue. I've tried to give all sort of neuroscience images because, you know, many of you are working in neuroscience. When you're trying to, you know, show someone what's happening in a tissue like this, maybe many of you already know, but there's a bunch of different stack tools. Actually, this shortcut here will, will like take you straight to stack tools. So if you're, if you're thinking of something with the Z stack, this button here will actually take you straight away to do like Z projections and things like that. And what I, I didn't mention, but this is like a very useful tool in Fiji is if you're thinking of something and you can't remember where it is in any of these menus, just type it in. And, you know, maybe like, you don't even have to have like the first few letters. You can just like have some of the letters and, you'll get a list of everything that's available. So, you know, even if you're wanting to do something you don't even know is possible in Fiji, this is like a great place to start. You can see straight away, I'm getting the Z projection here. And so th this is something that you'll often want to do if you've, you've got some 3D data and you just want to create a, like a 2D image to share with people about what's happening, you can uh, use Z project. And there's a few options here. I think like the most useful often for things like Z stacks is to do a max intensity. This is where we're, we're sort of going through pixel by pixel and, and choosing the brightest pixel from throughout the Z stack. And what you'll end up with is something that show clearly like where the cells and the projections are throughout that entire stack. But there, there are other times where you might want to do something a little bit differently. Some other ones that are useful here, if you're trying to measure like the, the total intensity for something, especially if these are 
cells that have been imaged on a dish and you're just wanting to say like how what is the total intensity inside that cell then a max intensity is not very useful in terms of quantification because that's just picking those brightest points you could use something like a uh, some intensity this way you're adding up all those slices together to get a total volume and that way you could just you know draw a region or automatically detect a cell measure its intensity and that intensity will reflect the entire cell intensity um, and then if you're trying to work in live imaging then things like average intensity is quite useful because then you can average over a few frames get rid of some of the noise and improve image quality so don't feel like this is just a tool to get a maximum intensity projection there's a lot more in here that depending on the project can be quite, quite useful. Yeah, the other thing with these 3D data sets, and this is actually really useful if you're working on the spinning disk, a very common problem that comes up is antibody penetration. So you might look at something on a wide field microscope, everything looks fine, but it's always worth going to a confocal if you're doing some new labeling experiments to make sure that the antibodies are getting into the tissue because just looking at it through a wide field, you don't get that sense. But on a confocal, you'll see clearly whether antibodies are going all the way into the tissue. And a nice way to look at that is to use an orthogonal projections. If we go here, we can just do an orthogonal view. This is also in the stacks menu. If we run this now, actually, this is actually not so clear. And this is a good example of why we should check the properties. If I go into, let's just close these. So actually, this is really common with TIFFs. If they've been exported you know, without much information, they'll lose some of the scaling information. So I know that this, this is actually three here, and it's actually close to 0.6 for X and Y. So if you change these, and I go back and run the orthogonal, now we have like a nice clear view of what's, what's happening throughout this tissue section. And I mean, this is imaged with the white sheet. So it's, you know, quite nice all the way through, but if this was on the spinning disc and I was seeing a lot of, um, or a confocal and I was seeing a lot of staining here and, and here at the bottom, but not so much in the middle, then that's a really good indication that if I was going to try and count cells with this sort of data that I, I wouldn't be able to trust the numbers that I was getting. So you would either try and optimize the staining or restrict your analysis to where you know the staining has been reliable. Um, and we can also do, you know, they're not as fancy as Imaris or Avia. I think in my mind, like if you want something that's really nice for visualization, those commercial tools are, you know, hard to beat. But if you're trying to set up a pipeline where you want to be very rigorous um, and you, you know, have control over doing things in an automatic way, very reliably, then Fiji actually can do much of what these other tools can do. And, and we'll sort of go through how to do that next week. Actually, even today, a, a useful thing, just so you can get a sense of this, underneath plugins, uh, under macros, there's a recorder here. Just open this up so that while we're doing some of this stuff for the rest of the session, you can get a sense of like, you know, how much of what we're doing is, is scriptable. Because I think, especially if many of you have been biologists, you don't have to get too deep into coding to be able to automate a lot of what you're doing in your work. And I feel like for many things, just scripting in image J is a, as much power as what you need to get through many of your projects um, without having to spend too long learning anything to do with scripting. Um, okay, just in terms of if I want to get a 3D image of this, we can just go into the stack menu here and there's a 3D project tool. Um, and this is where you can just get, you know, renderings where you're rotating the data and things like that. I can just run it with the default settings just so you can see how that will look. This will be pretty quick. It, it won't look so fantastic from the side. This is because it's just rendering these, these planes and it's not filling in the data between the planes. So to get a better result, make sure that you turn on this interpolation here. This way, like as it rotates, it'll be filling in those gaps between the slices and you'll get something like what you would see you know, in a sort of 3D rendering from some of these other tools. It'll take a little bit longer because it has to fill in that information. Okay, and now you can see like if we rotate this, we have a nice like 3D volume. It's a lot of times for data like this too, like especially if it's it's got a lot of information throughout the intensity range, just using a, a, a black and white lookup table is not a, a great option. 
there are uh, some useful lookup tables to deal with this. You know, things like fire is a really useful one just because it can let you see a lot more intensity information by using color to help you see those intensities. So these are just underneath lookup table here. Again, like this isn't changing the data, it's just changing how it looks. Okay. Actually, there's one other thing I wanted to show you. This is more useful for um, time series, but uh, you know, if you just need to show people what's happening in a few key frames, like if, if I tried to show this whole movie in a 2D image, it would be very difficult to look at, but, but there's some tools. So if I go into stacks, uh, tools, uh, there's some options in here to make sub stacks. And this is a really nice way if you're just trying to extract, what, maybe there's like a cell that's in the middle of this stack that you care about, then you can just say, uh, like, you know, this cell is between 15 and, and 20 slices. You can pull that out and do something with it. Or you can do something like, okay, I want the full range, but I only want a certain number of like every fifth or every sixth frame. You know, the instructions are just here. And this way you'll get like a, a data set that's much smaller. And we can then go in and it's easy for just search for it. There's some nice montage tools so we can make a montage. And so maybe this one, I just have five slices. So I'm just gonna say five columns in one row. And then you can do things like maybe put a bit of a border around the, the frames and you can label them. If, you, if you've if you labeled these as like, time, they might have time point names so that you can actually have what, what time the image was taken if it's a time series. And then straight away you have like a, a nice time series here that you can use in a presentation rather than having to go through all the effort of like cropping out images and putting them together in Illustrator or whatever you do. This is like ready to go. Yeah, sort of on the same track as that, like, it, if you need to just like put a scale bar on this, it's very easy just to type in scale bar here. And right now I didn't type in, there was, it was in microns, but it, we could fix that. You can change like what that scale bar should be, whether it's like 10 microns, 50 microns. There's a whole lot of choices here in terms of how this looks. And if I, if I do this, then I'm ready to go and just put that in the you know, presentation. Let me just fix it. Uh, The other thing I could do is say, maybe I wanted to show how big that cell was. I could just draw a circle on that cell and then go back to scale bar. Uh, it's a little bit hard, but maybe I'll change the color. And you can see like, you can get a quick measurement there if you were trying to show someone something on the image. So like, I think, you know, some of these things like they're a little bit hidden away, but you know, if you can think of it, oftentimes it's actually possible to do with, with Fiji. Just sort of more on this sort of measurements. Because we've got the scaling correct now, if we draw a line, then you'll actually see if you're looking, so a lot of the information has always been shown up in the status bar here. So if you're just trying to say like, okay, how long is this you know, cell? I can get a length here. Um, same with these, like if I'm measuring, if I wanna just draw a box, I'll get information on the actual um, size of that just up in the status bar here. You know, for many of you, you want to actually do something like measure you know, where these cells are, how intense they are, what other proteins are, are sort of expressed in the cell. You know, in the worst case scenario, that's gonna be a manually drawing on the image. Although I think in most cases now, it's possible to do this automatically and maybe not with all the basic features I show you today, but certainly like, you know, the next couple of workshops we do, you'll have a good idea of how to do things well automatically. But if you are sort of stuck in a situation where you had to do it by drawing, you know, You've probably tried some of these before where you can you know draw a polygon around something to to, to pick it up. Um, there's actually some other useful ones. This one, if this ellipse tool, if you double click on it, you can actually turn it into a brush. This is actually really useful for quickly selecting a lot of things. So if I turn on brush selection, 
Um, I can choose the size of the brush. Then I can just go through and start, well, maybe that's not coming through so clearly. If I hold down shift, then I can just start painting on the image. So I can very quickly start like drawing on these cells um, without having to draw like individual ROIs. This is a nice way if I'm just trying to like get an idea of like where all these cells are. Um, and I, you can erase it just by drawing over the, the region without holding down shift. So this is actually kind of a really nice way of doing things quickly. Yeah, to, and to clear this stuff, just shift A, that just clears everything. So there's no more selection. I'm just gonna draw on this one so it's a little bit easier to see in terms of contrast. It, if you're drawing on these cells and you want to keep them individual, what you can do is, you know, maybe this is going to be my cell here. If you press T, it'll actually add it to an ROI manager. And this is a really powerful tool. I, I can just like, you know, quickly go through and mark these. I'm just doing it very quickly here, but you can spend more time. And these are, are marked not just in 2D, but 3D space. So if I go to a different slice now and I pull this up, it should remember like which slice I, I made these ROIs. So you can, you can do these manually. And once you've, you've done something like this, you can go back to another image and, and, and pull them up. It will remember like wh where they are. So, you know, if this was a different channel, maybe I, I was looking at some cells in this channel, but I wanted to look at the color in another channel, then I can just you know, actually a really good example is if this was a time series image, it's a Z stack, but we can just imagine this was a time course. You have different neurons that are pulsing on and off. I can create a maximum intensity projection, which is the one I have here. And this is a great image for just picking up where all the cells are. So I could use an automatic way, or I could do a manual way of just selecting these cells. And then I can come across to my, my time series. And so I have a couple of cells here. But I want, to, I want to measure now what's happening activity-wise in these cells. So what I can do is say, okay, these are my three cells. I want to use these ROIs in this image. And there's a whole lot of tools in here. We won't go through all of this stuff today, but underneath more, there's a whole lot of things you can do. And, and one of these, which is really useful for, for this type of problem is multi-measure. If I just run multi-measure now, it will measure the intensity of those cells across the whole time series. And then straight away, and this is really quick in this case, I have like the time point, and then I have the, the mean intensity of each of those in, in the area and things like that, if it was changing. You know, that, that can be like a, if you're trying to do that in other software, it can actually take you quite a while to get to this point. It's very quick to do here. And like these should be staying where they are, regardless of what you're doing here. But if you are worried, you can save them. So sometimes if you're doing a, a pipeline and you want to just have a record of what these look like, you can save them as a small file and then load them back in. So that could be, if you're spending a long time making ROIs and you're really paranoid about losing them, that's a that's an, a useful trick to, to use. Yeah, so what I was going to show you finally is, in this case, we're just looking somewhere in the tissue, but sometimes you might have a, a volume of, of tissue in the image and then you have some cells or something in that tissue and you want to get an idea of like what the density is or how much volume those cells are occupying inside the, the volume of the tissue. And there's a really easy way to do something like that. First of all, like any measurements we're making, I should have shown you, we can set what measurements we're using underneath set measurements here. And by default, we've just got area and min max and mean. There's a lot, you know, in here, there's some really useful things to think about it depending on your project. Like in terms of intensity, integrated density is actually a nice one to use. This is really useful. You know, if you're looking at cells and you're trying to get I mean, an idea of how bright they are, how much protein is in them, just taking the mean intensity sometimes is not so useful because if that cell is very small and compact and very bright, it could have just as much protein in it as a cell that's very big and dim. And so if you just take the mean value, you might be saying, okay, that cell is has less protein or it's less bright, but it's really a factor of its shape and its size as well. And so integrated density is just taking into account the area of the cell and its mean intensity. So, you know, a, a big dim cell and a, a small bright cell that had the same amount of protein in them would actually have the same value as an integrated density reading. So that's something to think about. Another one that like is not always used, but it's kind of useful is kurtosis is how like evenly distributed the fluorescence is. So if you're trying to measure something that's like, is this cell more punctate or more textured, more textured, then 
it'll have a higher kurtosis number. If it's like very homogeneous, like these cells, then it'll have a very low kurtosis. Um, and there's a whole lot of things in here to do with size and, and, and shape um, measurements too. So you can choose these in here. The other things I wanted to point out is we can do something called limit to threshold, which I'll show you how, how that can be useful. And we can also redirect to. So if you're, you have some kind of thing going on where you're, you have some ROIs appearing on this image, but you're interested in what's happening in, in this image, you can redirect your measurements to that image. So maybe you're detecting cells in red, but you're measuring in green. And that, this is a really useful way of just doing that very quickly using the redirect option. Yeah, if, if I wanted to use the threshold tool, so say, you know, let's just imagine this was like a, the, the tissue, like outside this yellow line, there was just no tissue. So this is kind of like a tissue section or something like that. I can measure um, just by doing command M or control M if you're on a PC. Now I have my area here. And now I want to get an idea of like how much area is actually occupied by, by these cells. Just to make sure I do this properly, I'm just going to clear outside so I get rid of those cells. So now we're just looking at these cells that are in this region. So a very quick way, I mean, you could try and detect these or you could try and draw ROIs on them, but a really fast way is if we just use a threshold and this is command shift T. And you know, very simply the way a threshold works is we're just saying everything, in this case, we're saying everything above this number is what we care about. So that's the foreground and everything below this number is background or what we don't care about. I mean, so I can adjust this to some somewhere for what I care, you know, I think is the cells, you know, I'm just gonna choose something arbitrary here. And if I wanted to get an idea of like how big that area is, then I can just say, set measurements and, and just make sure I limit it to the threshold. So this way, when I do a measurement now, I don't even have to apply this threshold. I can just leave it active. I can do another measurement. I need to okay that first. And now I've got a, a measurement of what this um, area of the cells is. And I even have kind of a mean intensity of all those cells if, if that was useful to me. So that, that's like a really quick way of getting those measurements that can be you know, much faster than doing things very manually and drawing these ROIs. I'm just gonna, Go back to another image for the next part. So we can use, we can even go back to this neurons image actually. So I'm just going to adjust these intensities again. So I can see the colors. Yeah, so this, I mean, this is a very easy example again where we can see where the protein is, but sometimes you might have to show someone a profile of where the intensity is. A really good example is sometimes you're trying to convince someone that a protein is on the membrane of the cell and it may not be so convincing with an image, but you can show that using a profile. It's very easy to do profiles with image J. In fact, actually it's better if we do this, I'm just gonna, so this is quick, I'm just gonna extract this. So a useful, if you're ever doing any troubleshooting or you want to try a filter or something like that, a really useful thing is to duplicate the image and that's command shift D and you can duplicate just the ROI or you can duplicate the whole stack depending on what you're trying to do. So this is a really good way of just, if you're not sure of what you're going to do is a good idea or you just want to test it, duplicate first and then you can, you know, do what you want and then go back to your original data. And I want to split the channels here. So many of you probably know about the, pro the profile tool. Like if I wanted to draw a profile through here, I can draw with the line. You know, if I wanted to get a, an idea of what's happening more than just one pixel, again, like if you double click here, you can say how thick that line should be. So I could make this a little bit thicker. And now you can see like a faint yellow color there where it's actually sampling across the you know either side of that line. I can make it a little bit wider. Uh, to, so to plot this, I can just press K. And like many of you probably know about this, but what's actually really useful about ImageJ is these are kind of dynamic and can be combined. So if I wanted to plot what's happening in the cell over here as well, uh, I can save this you know, just by pressing T. Now it's, it's in this manager here. Another useful thing, if you're just doing one region and you don't want to use the ROI manager, you can just go to the other image and press Command-Shift-E that just 
draws the last ROI that you had. So you can very quickly just like make this the same line. And if I press K again, now I have a, a plot of, of the cell and this sort of um, expression of protein here in the cell. You could export this to, if I click list here, you could just export this to Excel and plot it there if you were trying to make a nicer figure. But you can also start to look at these together. What you can do in here, you can add both of them together into the same plot. So I can say add from plot and say, all right, actually I want this plot to be in there as well. I, I want to give it a color. I can say this one should be green. Actually, this is my cell, so I'll make this red. So here's my cell and, uh, and here I can also, you know, there's a whole lot of things in here. I just wanted to show you some basic things, but we can also change the color of the green staining to be green. And so straight away I have like, you know, if I was just trying to do something for a presentation and I wanted to be fairly quick, this is a very easy way to get a nice, profile of what's actually happening in the cell here. And if that was something like a membrane protein where it was more difficult to convince someone of overlap, then this would be a nice way of just showing very clearly. Can I ask uh, yeah. what happens when you make the, when you make your line thicker? Oh, sure. So when we're making that line thicker, it's, it's actually taking into account all those pixels across the width. So instead of just, you know, measuring the, the value underneath that line, it's actually sampling across that full range of yellow. Um, and it's actually like one thing where it's really useful is if you were looking at protein trafficking along like a dendrite or something like that, which is probably maybe more than one pixel, if you wanted to do something where you were tracking that movement, then you could make a wider, a wider line like that. And that's a really nice way of sampling across the whole dendrite very easily. I, I just wanted to cover a couple of other things that like uh, are really useful in terms of using image J, getting into more image segmentation and Especially, I, I find sometimes when people are very new to image processing and they're just trying to get some something better than what they have with their images, you know, it's you sort of tempted to sort of play around in here. And you know, there's many different filters on, in here, and they do different things. And you know, you might try what what sort of what you think looks better. And on a very basic level, I can show you like com two common filters that people use: um, a mean and a median filter. And I can show you like why you might want to use one other than the other. If I just split this. So in terms of filters, very briefly, if we actually zoom right in, let's use this image. So if we zoom right in, these, these pixels, they're really just numbers. And you know, the number of this pixel is 2682. This, the intensity of this one is a little bit higher. Um, and filters will, will go along with what's called like a kernel. So they'll be looking at what's happening in an array of these pixels and, and they'll, they'll do something to it. Like a mean filter will like take the, um, the mean of, if we do use just like a one pixel radius for this pixel, it'll take the mean of these, these and just, and then update the value of that pixel there. And that can be, you know, sometimes people will use a mean filter to sort of smooth out the data the other one is a median filter, which is very common, will take the median value. And in fact, a median filter can be nice for a bunch of things because it, it, it's an edge preserving filter. So sometimes when we're trying to smooth out the data, we don't want to blur the edges. We, don't want, we want to keep some of the structural information. So if you have a noisy image and you're trying to preserve the structure, and especially if that noise is like salt and pepper noise, like very like hot pixels or things where it's just very isolated to an individual pixel, I can show you just how effective that filter is. If, if we, let's just use this image as an example. I can give you a better example of this probably. If we even look at this image, this is just another very small image with cells in tissue. Like it's probably more common if you're working on the slide scanner, this is probably a fairly common sort of image for you to see. You've got a lot of tissue, tissue background and some cells. If I put some noise on this, It becomes very hard now, like, you know, this, the processes weren't as clear in this image as the other one. And now we've added some noise, they're kind of like completely obscured. If, let me just get another one open. So you might be tempted to like blur this image, maybe to try and make it easier to analyze. So if I do that, um, let me just duplicate it again. So 
Okay, so here's here's another copy. If I apply a, like a mean filter to this, I, I won't, I'll just make a fairly small one. Maybe I'll say, two, you know, even I can just say one. Like I, I've kind of made it better, but like you can definitely still see that noise here. And if I make a stronger filter, it's just going to become more and more blurry. If I use a median filter for this. It's actually very effective. So if I just say one, yeah, we can, we can get very much close back to sort of what we had originally. Um, and so that can be, you know, I won't spend too much time on it, but if we also look at the, the features of these neurons, a medium filter will actually preserve those, those features a, a little bit better as well. So some of the structure of the cell, they won't become sort of blurrier and bigger. They'll stay as the same shape as they were. And so that can be a nice way of dealing with some of the noise that you might have in, a, in an image. And that would always be done for presentation purposes, but all your analysis would be done on the um, messed with one. <clears throat> yeah, so th like a lot of these sort of, um, and I'll, I'll show you a couple others in a second in terms of like helping to detect cells. Yeah, like in terms of making a measurement on intensity, you should be making measurements on the unprocessed image and except for taking into account background, you wanna try and have a measurement of what the background is near a cell ideally so that you can take that into account. But a lot of these filters, we, we're using them to be able to see something in the image more clearly. So whenever you apply an, a filter to an image, you're always losing information, but hopefully you'll see something more clearly. And so all these like filters that you might use are really just helping you to get at isolating the cell or isolating the axons or dendrites better. And then of course, here you make your measurements on unaltered uh, data. Yeah, I wanted to show you, uh, if you were in the, the BrainJ workshop, you would have already seen this, but in case you missed that, I, I mean, a really common filter that we use for dealing with problems like this, where we're, we're trying to isolate cells. And you can see like across this image here, we have a lot of, we have like the cells or this sort of higher frequency information of the cells and the axons and dendrites. Um, and then we have a whole lot of sort of low frequency information, which is like the, the background of the tissue. And a really good way to visualize that if, if I just draw a line, um, I'll try and draw a line for a few, through a few cells here if I can. If I plot this line, you can get a sense of, uh, you know, there's a couple of cells here and then we've got this increasing background uh, if I tried to do something like, you know, maybe I wanted to try and detect these cells. If I apply a threshold, then straight away, I'm going to have this problem where if I, if I sort of use a high threshold, I'll get some of the cells that I'm missing the faint ones. If I go too low to get the rest, I'm starting to include the background. And this is like a really, really common problem. And there's a really good solution for it. The one we most often use for dealing with this sort of problem is called a rolling ball or background subtraction filter. And the, the best way to think about it, so it's just here. Yeah, subtract background. So this, this rolling ball radius, I mean, the best way to think about this is, this is the radius of a ball that will is sort of roll across the image. And you can imagine this is kind of the slope. If I flip this, and imagine the ball rolling across this slope. If we made the ball big enough that it wouldn't fall into these sort of valleys, um, but, but follow the gradient, we would actually have a, be able to sort of see what that gradient is, take that away, but leave these peaks of the cells unchanged. And so the way to think about these sort of filters is just to make a filter that's big enough to ignore these cells. And so uh, on an image like this, probably you know something like 12 or 14 will be will be good. It, these cells, the, their size is roughly 15 or so to 20 pixels in, in here. In fact, we could just, you know, if we wanted to, we could just measure them. We could draw a line through them and I could see like roughly how big they are. Um, you can try a preview here, but it can be a little bit hard to see if, if, if when it's subtracting that intensity away. So like, you know, sometimes, just duplicate the image if you're not sure of how it's going to turn out and then apply it. We can leave, like all this stuff here, you can leave switched off. Now we have a new image where this, this background has been removed. And if I bring this slider down, 
you can see like some of this, these are actually projections from the cell. So it's not actually part of the tissue background. And you can see how much better this image is than this image in terms of isolating the cells. And if I tried to do a threshold now on this one, it's a lot easier to, to pull out those cells versus what we had before. And actually just to sort of help make that even more clear, if I put my um, line back on this image and plot it, we should be able to see the difference here of like how that, that slope has been, or the gradient has been removed. The other sort of way of dealing with this problem is to, to filter this image because we have high frequency information, which are the cells and the projections, and we have low frequency information, which is all this sort of tissue background. And, and one way that um, people deal with this instead of using the, this sort of background subtraction um, is to, to do an image calculation. Let me just clear this up a little bit. Actually, you know, one useful thing too, if, you've, if you're using image data, you often end up in this situation where you can't even see where the Fiji bar is. If you just press enter, that will get you back to seeing like where Fiji is. We might go into this in a little bit more detail next week, but one really useful thing in image processing is to, to use image calculators. That's where we can have a, a few different images, of, uh, like versions of an image or different information in, in different images. And then we actually calculate a new image from them. And, and a good example of that is if I wanted to get rid of the background in this, this image, what I can do is duplicate this image and do uh, some smoothing. For smoothing, actually, it can be a little bit better to do a Gaussian, Gaussian blurring. And if we use a high, so if I just do a little bit, um, you'll see like it just blurs out the projections, but it's, I can still see the cell bodies here. But if I increase this enough, I'm now just sort of getting a rough idea of what the intensity is like in the tissue, but I can't see these cell bodies anymore. And so you should be able to find something where you can not see some of the, the features like the cells, but you're still capturing some information on what the tissue is like. I can see this bright area, which is this bright area here. And now what I can do is take these two images and use an image calculator. And I can say, okay, here's my um, coronal section, like the raw data. And I can, you know, in here we can use a whole lot of different things, but for this, we want to subtract it. I want to subtract away this, this blurred image. And we'll get something that's similar to what we have with the rolling ball filter. So I know a lot of people would like prefer this for some things, but you can see it's not so nice for some of the, the areas up here. We got a little bit better with background subtraction, but just so you know, like these are some of the options that you have available to you to try and, if you're stuck on these cell detection problems, these can be really, really useful. Okay, I think like the last sort of stuff I wanted to show you is how you can do some of this uh, cell segmentation in image J, like this will just be, you know, fast manual ways, but it can be very easily scaled up to automated. If we take an image like this one, actually I'll just do a, a background subtraction again. I think that's a little bit easier. So say we wanted to detect these cells automatically. The first thing we want to do is just threshold this image. And you know, we've sort of looked at that already, like we can do a, a threshold here. This is a manual threshold. And sometimes maybe that's all you'll need to do, but other times you might need to be doing things automatically. Um, there's ways of the software analyzing this histogram to automatically pick where is a, a good place to put the threshold. And we often, like for biomedical imaging, we often use this OTSU method of determining a threshold. You can see this is picking a threshold, which is you know, close to what we picked manually. There's a few others in here. So these will be useful if you had different images and you didn't want to introduce any, any bias or, or something like that, you can rely on an automatic threshold. So the first step is just getting a thresholded image. And we'll cover some better ways than this actually next week and, and the subsequent week. But, but just for today, let's just apply this threshold. Now we have some sort of cells segmented. We have some small sort of background stuff we don't care about. We have some that are like you can see they're a little bit joined together here. And an easy way to deal with this sort of like over segmentation where you have a lot of joining, um, if the threshold is not solving that, is to do a, a watershedding. This is where we actually sort of find a, a break point between these cells. And you'll find that in here under watershed. If I, when I click this, you should see some breaks appearing. And, and like this is 
you know, there's better ways of doing this, but this is a, a sort of quick and dirty way of, of quickly counting cells. You can see now these cells have been fairly well broken apart. Once you have an image like this, where we have some thresholded data, we can go into analyze. And the tool here is analyze particles. This is kind of like what a lot of people end up doing in Imaris. Actually, the, just in a minute, I'll show you how to very quickly do this in 3D. But we can analyze the particles in this image. So we're just basically counting the, the cells or the blobs. And we can set some size parameters here. So we, you know, if we know these things are all smaller than 50, 50 pixels or, or microns, we can set that size um, and, and set an upper limit. Maybe we don't care how big they are. We can make this really big. We can set a circularity. Like if these, these things here that are very straight, which are the projections, they're going to have a very low circularity. So we could actually use some circularity filtering here to get rid of some of these very uh, linear structures. And then we can say what we want to see afterwards. Like overlay is nice in the sense it will show you where it detected the um, cells. Uh, and then we can sort of display the results and get a you know measurements and all that sort of stuff automatically. So if I run this and we can just clear the results. So um, now you can see, you know, it's, it has a, isn't perfect. We could refine this a little bit more if, if we had some time, but you can sort of see it's picked up all of these objects here. It's added them to the ROI manager. So now if I wanted to make some measurements on a different channel, I could. If I, if I wanted to measure this over time, if it was a time course, then I, I could use that feature we looked at before. So you know, this is like a, a really useful way of doing these uh, very quick sort of cell detections. And you know, just to show you one last thing for this, You know, the same thing applies for, for 3D images. So if, if um, you know, I wanted to analyze what was happening in this 3D image, let me just clean this up a little bit. Actually, if you have a lot of stuff open, you can just say close all. So again, we could we could um, you know we could do a background subtraction to clean this up. We could do, then do a threshold. Um, it's important actually. This will often be on by default, calculate a threshold for each image. You wanna turn that off if you're doing a 3D stack so that the consistent threshold is applied throughout the entire uh, volume. You know, this is sort of something now like uh, many people would go to Amaris with, but you know, in here, we can actually do a 3D object um, analysis. There's a whole lot of options in here about you know, what you wanna measure and, and how you wanna do the analysis. So this this is something that you could script and and you know make these measurements automatically for you know however many cells or images you have, and then we can run this. And you know very briefly, this is just to exclude cells that are touching the edge. If we were worried about those, um, I'm just going to run this now just so we can see what it looks like. So it'll do this sort of thresholding per per slice, and then connect those together. So what we'll end up with is you know, really nice in terms of like just seeing what's actually happening. You'll get just here, object map. You'll, you'll have color coded which, which objects are which. Uh, maybe the threshold was a little bit low. I've got some projections here as well. But if I had it a little bit higher, then we would have the individual cells uh, popping up. And so you know, something that you were sort of maybe doing in Amaris that you were spending a long time you know, manually doing or going through the wizard every every single volume. With some refinement here, you can get something working quite well in, in an automated fa automated fashion. And if we actually look over here in the recorder, pretty much everything that we were doing, you know, these are all being recorded in here. And so, you know, if there's something that you're doing manually frequently, this can be really useful in terms of actually starting to do automatically. And and you know, in the next session. We'll go into some details about how you can use this to very quickly build up a macro to run over all the images in a folder so that you can do a lot of the things that you're spending hours doing um, just in the background while you're doing something else. Yeah, I, I think that that's the, the main stuff I wanted to show you. I think while I'm just before we finish up, you know, if you a great place to sort of find out more about this, you know, if you're searching on the web, there's a few good places where you'll learn about different plugins that people are using. And the way that you can add those to ImageJ is underneath, actually you want to update. So if you go help and then update, it'll do, do a quick update of VG and find 
whatever sort of plugins need updating. But if you just go through this process, there's a button here called manage update sites. And many of the sort of common or useful plugins are, are managed through here. So if you click on in this, you'll actually see, and this, this list is fairly comprehensive. There's many different plugins that are tailored for you know, specific projects, often things that you might be doing. There's a whole lot of different neuroscientist groups that are, are using ImageJ to do things as deep learning. There's a whole lot of stuff that is available in here that extends the sort of basic functionality. Does anyone have any like questions that can be related to what we went through or other things to do with uh, Fiji? Hi, Luke. Uh, yeah. Great presentation. So I have a question about um, recall this micro and run automatic analysis. So maybe next week you can show us an example in, in which case uh, we have data set from individual animal. Mm -hmm. And how do we write a micro to like go in extract data from uh, individual folder to a threshold and then find region of interest and do some basic an analysis. So what okay. you are today is just like, we have this one file and we call it a micro, we process. Um, and but more often like we need to do group analysis. Yeah, so just so I'm clear on that, you, you've got an image, you have like, a, what are you trying to extract from the image? Is it where there's an injection or? Uh, so for example, if we have one set of experiment mm -hmm. and label some neurons in each animal mm -hmm. and we go and pick some convoke image and save save the fi all the files from individual animal within the same folder mm -hmm. and we have one folder for each animal. Mm -hmm. So how do we write a, a record a micro to like process one by one and then save the save data as an output? Oh, sure. Yeah, so that, that's definitely what we'll get into next week. Uh, I think, you know, uh, sometimes people feel like this sort of could be difficult to learn or maybe take more time than they think, but we can go through this, you know, next week within an hour and a half. I think, you know, everyone should be feeling fairly comfortable to do something like that. So how to automatically process a folder, create tables, create images, um, and then we can look at, um, you know, some, some sort of detection and things like that. Um, and in fact, there's sort of, week after we were I was sort of planning to focus on using elastic but I think what we'll do is we'll use elastic for this automatic stuff but we'll also look at some deep learning analysis as well so we'll sort of put that in together because I think elastic has been a great tool for this sort of automatic this is what we're using brain j for a lot of things but just so you guys are using like cutting edge tools for this we'll cover deep learning as well so hopefully that'll be helpful for you guys yeah, but definitely You're, next week we'll cover All that. Right. Great, thank you.